It's often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. A cartoon, well done, is worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> if I was going to be upset by cartoons, I should have retired from politics a long time ago. Cartoons are good, even those that are bad. That isn't really the heat, it's uh, the humility. You list trash showed. Politics is hell. Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Mon Dieu. If this keeps up, the, uh, the chair will never recognize me. Mr. Speaker. You're a heckler, basically. Uh, you're a heckler as you're working in a contemporary sense. Uh, the cartoon later on could be as an interesting history. There's no way, there's no way in which you can uh, deal with a heckling cartoonist. If he's good, he, you know, he's good and you just have to take it. <laughs> That's much better. <laughs> I think inwardly, when a politician sees himself savagely attacked by a cartoonist, uh, he is very upset because I think politicians are just as sensitive as anybody else. They're smart enough, however, not to show it. Canada's 15 prime ministers and an abundance of opposition leaders have kept cartoonists in business since Confederation. But there have been caricaturists and cartoonists in this land since the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, and they've been accorded as much abuse as appreciation. They can get more hate mail than most politicians, and enough obscene phone calls to make a spinster swoon. They've been sued, thrown in jail, and run out of town on a rail. One had his home firebombed. Another was badly beaten up. But nonetheless, they don't complain and neither do the wiser of their victims. <laughs> Looks like it's gonna be another one of those days. <coughs> the Right Honorable John George Diefenbaker holds the undisputed title of being the most caricatured politician in Canadian history. And his features did much to advance the career of the Toronto Star's Duncan McPherson, who leads the elite corps of cartoonists who have squared off against a prominent politician with both winning national recognition in the process. Sir David Lowe, I suppose the most famous cartoonist in the world in his time, uh, said of me uh, that I had the kind of physiognomy that made me a cartoonist dream. I had all the appearance of an intelligent cockatoo. Mr. Diefenbaker was Canada's 13th Prime Minister for six years, during which time he bombarded the Liberals with every chunk of ammunition he could get his hands on. He was relished by cartoonists of all political stripes, but to the Tory voters of Saskatchewan, he was regarded as somewhat close to the deity. Yeah, John G. Diefenbaker speaking. The only identification in that one are the teeth, without which I don't know what cartoonists would have done. I've seen some of McPherson's cartoons, and this is one, in which, on the basis of some of his criticism, I could sing, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> when I first started political cartooning, it must have been the first week that I was on the job with the paper, 
And I, uh, the Avril situation in Toronto where Diefenbaker closed down the plant and the contract and what have you, it was a great kerfuffle at the time. Well, it was the time of the cancellation of the AV Row contract for the Arrow. And that was a controversial decision because it put in jeopardy the jobs of more than a thousand people. Indeed, they lost their jobs. But Diefenbaker did take a cavalier attitude towards those jobs. And this was the purpose of the first in cartoon to portray Diefenbaker as Marie Antoinette. And it was a wonderful caricature. It's perhaps the best thing McPherson has ever done. It's reprinted countless times, saying, hey, let them eat cake. Apparently, that's a cartoon that no one will understand excepting a person of intellectual background. I would like to have seen a cartoon when the Prime Minister asked the labor men from Montreal, who said, how are we going to live unless something's done? And he told them what they could eat. And it wasn't cake. <laughs> this puncturing of the sacrosanct, saintly Diefenbaker image, up until that time, Dief could do no wrong and thought he could do no wrong started a landslide of people poking fun at Diefenbaker. From then on, he was fair game. And I think, really, that did contribute to the beginning of the Diefenbaker uh, slide. Giving the chief another push was Peter Cooch of Winnipeg, who, disenchanted with the Tories' fiscal policies, coined a new currency, the Diefen dollar. That didn't get me too many votes. <laughs> One of the main issues of the 1963 campaign was a contentious policy on nuclear weapons that the United States was trying to impose on Canada. The volatile Beaumark issue not only enraged the electorate, it blew up into near mutiny within the ranks of the Conservative Party itself, and the chief's defeat was sealed. I think if a cartoonist zeroes in on one politician, one character, and continues to poke fun at him, he may, may very well erode the credibility or the image, the public image of that character, especially if the public image is a phony one. It's pompous to think that one cartoon or one anything can, uh, one word of the politician's mouth, yes, but uh, not one observation can damage a man. The only thing that can damage a man is his own mouth, it's, uh, period. It's, uh... As spokesman for the little guy, Dunk McPherson has been the Toronto Star's resident heckler for more than 15 years. But in all that time at the drawing board, even he can't say precisely what makes a cartoonist tick. There has to be a connection between the nature of the cartoonist and what he does. And uh, I defy any cartoonist to define it but it has to do with the nature of the person. You react to a situation a little bit differently than someone else. In fact, that's the key word, you react to a situation. Not because you're a moralist or anything like that. You're a, a contrary sort of a person. And uh, a cynic, I would say. If you're a strong politician, you have to throw it right out the window. You, I mean, you, if you were, uh, you have to be apolitical all the way. Not that there's a danger of favoritism, but uh, your thinking has to encompass all, the whole area. Now, pomposity and other attitudes, uh, that's where the fun comes in, in the caricature itself. You describe the person in the caricature, not the situation. If they say the cartoon is vicious, well, I have to accept it because that's their opinion. But if I didn't intend it to be vicious, I don't think I ever do in the sense that uh, I'm taking a vengeful attitude personally. If the only way to make the point is a pretty tough delivery, well, that's the way it's, the point's going to be made. By the way, if I finish a cartoon, I finish the inking on the cartoon, and they change their mind in the morning, well, that's, they run the railway, and I've done my job. No, the only area where, and it's fair enough, is in the composition of the cartoon. They don't agree with your viewpoint. Well, if you think you have a valid viewpoint, well, same as anything else, you have to fight for it a little bit. Uh, but it, uh, I've been convinced, too, that I'm a way off in left field and change the subject completely, but not that often. 
I'm the the audience. So it comes right down to it. And uh, I hope I'm not alienated from the mainstream of uh, sort of beverage room thinking. I might be. But I assume what I react to, or other people react to. I might be pompous so in that attitude, but uh, I hope I'm not. I developed a system of uh, taking the cartoon out, uh, just stopping anyone in sight, the first 10 people, and asking them to say yes or no on the cartoon. And if I got uh, six yeses, I'd take them back <laughs> into the editorial chief, and I said, well, I got six yes, four no, it looks like it goes. And he went along with it. I'd take these little polls. And stuff. That's <laughs> Incidentally, Mr. President, uh, Parliament is giving wiretapping legal status in Canada. Dick? Uh, hello, uh, Dick? Uh, hello? Uh, hello? Trudeau's flamboyance, like Diefenbaker's teeth, provides contemporary cartoonists with ample opportunity to express themselves. But Canada's very first cartoonist also had an easy time of it when he took on General James Wolfe. This portrait of Wolfe was painted by the Marquis of Townsend, third in command of the English forces besieging Quebec. The Marquis then turned his talents to caricature and found a prominent target in Wolfe's nose. He amused himself and his junior officers by ridiculing Wolfe's obsession with hygiene in a series of cartoons that were passed around before the Battle of Quebec. What depth is this latrine? 25 feet, General. What? Only one inch per man? Not enough. We would be engulfed by the first discharge. Dig on. Ironically enough, after Wolfe succumbed on the battlefield, it was George the cartoonist who accepted the surrender of Quebec. Ever since then, Canada's fighting men have provided ammunition for cartoonists throughout history. Don't mind them having their little traditions, but this is the fourth fired admiral this week who's decided to go down with his desk. There's something about a uniform that brings a gleam to a cartoonist's eye. Perhaps it's because, iconoclasts as they are, anything that smacks of authoritarianism they feel deserves an occasional slap. It's something to be uh, defied, without a doubt. So, even if you agree, defy it just for good measure. Most cartoonists who really, I feel, in my opinion, know what they're doing are guys who can't stand authority. Well, if you start agreeing with it, uh, a lot of things happen, <laughs> such as Watergate. <laughs> you were investigating the theft of our secret file, and somebody stole your what? The Mounties haven't always been figures of merriment. In the early part of this century, Arthur George Racy of the Montreal Star proposed that our stout-hearted men in red were just what were needed to clean up Chicago. Now in the U.S. there's the old FBI To catch up those nasty red Russians that spy But up here in Canada it's plain to see We're safe in the hands of the RCMP The RCMP, the RCMP We're safe in the hands of the RCMP The style was crude, the mood mellow. But to begin at the beginning, it wasn't always so. In 1842, the humor magazine Punch was founded in England. It took seven years for the idea to cross the Atlantic, and John Walker in Punch in Canada became the first cartoonist to hit print in this country. Punch touched off a veritable explosion in the Canadian publishing industry, with periodicals popping up all over the place. Walker worked for most of them in succession, including the highly successful Canadian Illustrated News, the first photo-illustrated journal in the world. Walker's English audience relished his derision of French Canadians. But his counterpart at the time, Jean-Baptiste Côté, in a series of woodcuts, hacked away at the idea of confederation in his Quebec weekly, La Cie, The Saw. 
The idea of one Canada didn't move the cartoonist to rapture. And his anti-English sentiments were more visceral than cerebral. But the melancholy lone vigilante, for that's how Cote saw himself, finally met his match. His series of sketches depicting a not-so-fanciful view of how a Quebec civil servant spent his working day <sighs> appeared on a Saturday in 1866. The following week, as a result of this sketch, Cote was in jail, and La Cie ceased to be. Along came Confederation, Canada's first prime minister, and a young, prolific, and potent cartoonist named John Wilson Ben Goff. Ben Goff became to his period and generation uh, the representation of the antithesis of everything McDonald's. And no matter what Sir John A. did, he was caricatured. Uh, the uh, caricatures were not vicious, sometimes malicious, always revealing. And Sir John enjoyed those cartoons, although on occasion he was known to have spoken of Ben Goff in a way uh, that cast some doubts on his ancestry. 21-year-old Ben Goff, in his immensely popular weekly called Grip, like many a cartoonist since, singled out the Prime Minister for his most savage assaults. But then Sir John's many eccentricities gave Ben Goff all the opportunities he needed. Alexander Mackenzie, on the other hand, who became Canada's second prime minister, was a stolid, upright, industrious Scot. In short, for purposes of a cartoonist, a washout. The best the Canadian Illustrated News could do in 1876 was take Darwin's theory of evolution as grounds for speculation on the origins of the two leaders. Even in ridicule, Sir John fared better than Sandy. It was widely known that whenever stricken by political or personal grief, and there were many instances, Sir John indulged in monumental benders, some drinking bouts lasting weeks. Grip exposed this flaw in the Prime Minister's character at a time when he was pledging prosperity and industry. Ah, you're right, Sir John. <laughs> Looking through this medium, I do see factory chimneys in every town and village in the country. <laughs> in 1891, Sir John fought his last election campaign on one main issue. He accused the Grits of trying to sell out Canada to the United States. The Conservatives commissioned color posters showing the opposition sitting down with Uncle Sam to redraw the map of North America. And in the early 1900s, a new and brilliant satirical magazine called The Moon appeared, with one of its early features being this sequence entitled Pipe Dreams. A respectable old party was one day seen to enter a disreputable joint and to indulge freely. He first sees himself as the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Now he thinks he owns the largest, most powerful and finest navy that has been. He next dreams that he controls the world's money and other markets. He imagines that John Bull comes cringingly to his feet and begs permission to exist. His greatest ambition is realized. He dreams that he has licked all creation and throws bouquets at himself. Now he thinks his army the finest, his daughters the most beautiful, his colleges the best, and his constitution the grandest in the world. He gathers the world into his grip and is reaching for the other planets when... He 
awakens and finds that he is the cause of much amusement. <laughs> How sad that the moon's dream is now nightmarishly true. All right, sweetheart, how about you and me going steady? But there's consolation in the fact that we've still got cartoonists around, like McPherson, who can make us laugh, even hollowly, as it hurts. Oh, we share a common border with a country that you know. Just take a look at your atlas, it's the one that's down below. There's 50 states in the Union and something should be done To forget the war of 1812 and make it 51 There'll be color television, social security You can even be a commie when we're Canada, USA On both sides of the border, Duncan McPherson is ranked at the peak of his profession by his confrere. But recognition has its perils. Cartoonist Paul Zepp of the Boston Globe, a young Canadian, has in the past, to use the euphemism, often been influenced by McPherson. There is a fellow last year that won the Pulitzer Prize in the States, which is considered the most prestigious prize. When I got notice of this book, I remember that in Canada we have another cartoonist who seems to copy him. The books are the same size, same presentation, but inside you have the same composition as in this one, and the same drawing. Well, this is plagiarism, and this fellow gets the praise of praise. So once he got it uh, this uh, spring, I immediately wrote to McPherson to congratulate him. <laughs> And it did amuse, of course, the, the feel of cartoonist. Imitation, as the cliché goes, is the most sincere form of flattery. If so, Len Norris must have blushed all over when after depicting the cause of Vancouver's traffic problems, he saw this cartoon appear in a San Francisco newspaper signed Graysmith. Cartoons are are sometimes list, lifted from far out backward places like Vancouver by Americans thinking that no one will ever, ever know about it, you know. And uh, this has happened a number of times. But sometimes what looks like barefaced plagiarism turns out to be sheer coincidence. When Sir Wilfrid Laurier became prime minister in 1896, Sam Hunter in Toronto colored him black and showed him carrying on the Tory tradition of toadying to the moguls of the CPR. Meanwhile, in Montreal, the eminent Henri Julien, the only cartoonist in Canada to have a street named after him, had seized on the same theme. But he put the whole Laurier cabinet in blackface, and the Montreal Star published a wildly popular book entitled The Bytown Coons. The man of majestic pose and of the flashing eye I'm an understudy of Sir Johnny's nose and affect his blood red tie I am the man with the silver tongue I climb the ladder rung by rung I found that talking face Nobody took offense, well, hardly anybody, at the depiction of MPs as minstrels. But in Montreal in the early part of this century, anti-Semitism was rampant. This is how cartoonist Joseph Charlebois predicted the makeup of Montreal City Council by the year 1950. Although Charlebois was famed as a cartoonist in other areas, he cashed in on bigotry in a big way, with a 25 cent comic book entitled simply Montreal Jew. But in Montreal's Canadian Illustrated News, bigots themselves were held up to ridicule. Why are you sending me offy? Because you can't, or won't, assimilate with us. What is that? You won't drink whiskey and talk politics and vote like us. In Vancouver, the province sneered at Chinese New Year, presumably because the sight of people enjoying themselves over a 10-day stretch 
upset the staid British Columbians. Meanwhile, the friendly folks on the prairies were kept chortling by the white man's vision of the native people. Heap fine country. But the preeminent cartoonist of the prairies for over 25 years, from 1927 on, was Arch Dale of the Winnipeg Free Press, who didn't have to stoop to racial slurs. Not when he had R.B. Bennett mismanaging the country during the Depression. Dale, a most undoer Scot, was an early example of a completely apolitical cartoonist. But he enjoyed baiting Bennett most of all. Not, not guilty. guilty. The Tory Prime Minister was not amused. Hmm. And I recall one time Mr. Bennett saying to me, and he was a man who never used any profanity, even the slightest. But he said, when I saw that, I could have horsewhipped him. <laughs> but whenever William Lyon Mackenzie King was in power, Dale, who worked for a pro-liberal newspaper, would take the occasional poke at him, too. Archie's political philosophy is recalled by his last editor, Bruce Hutchison. Well, Archie didn't know anything about politics, you know. He was a lovely guy, sweetheart of a fellow. And he did his job faithfully and well. But he, he didn't have any political ideas, and he didn't have to make the policy of the paper. We had, we had certain political policies. We were attacking certain people and defending certain others and so on. The only politician Archie truly despised was Alberta's social credit premier, William Eberhardt. Irreverently known as Bible Bill because of his Sunday evangelical radio broadcasts, Eberhardt was more lucid on Christian dogma than he was on social credit doctrine. We propose to take our first definite step toward the establishment of social credit. Social credit, the key to freedom. $25 a month for everybody. Cash money, a just price for all you sell. Vote for me and get all you want. Vote for me anyway. Closer to Bible Bill's pulpit, Stu Cameron of the Calgary Herald was going at the premier with gleeful fury. Cameron, like Dale, detested Bible Bill. But his attacks from within the province brought reprisals from rabid social credit supporters. Cameron's home was firebombed, and the cartoonist often had to enter and leave his newspaper office by way of the fire escape. In 1937, when Europe was on a rolling boil, Cameron saw similarities between the rantings of two dictators and Eberhardt's political fundraising radio broadcasts. So the cartoonist gave the Socred chief his own salute. He carried the analogy further in cartoon after cartoon. And eventually such attacks, backed by editorials, worked Eberhardt to such a frenzied rage that he attempted to pass legislation that would have imposed censorship of the press. He lost that fight in the courts. The Edmonton Journal won Canada's only Pulitzer Prize for its role in the conflict, and Bible Bill didn't know whether he was coming or going. But in the onslaught against demagoguery by the cartoonists of Canada, there has been one veritable David, Robert Lapalme. I'm a perfect five-footer. Who challenged Quebec's grotesque Goliath, Premier Maurice Duplessis. <laughs> Robert Lapalme has been an artist, caricaturist, and cartoonist for 40 years. When I make a caricature like uh, uh, Duplessis, I can draw Duplessis in five seconds. It doesn't look like him, because I have created his image. There is always uh, something that's funny with caricature. You create some symbol, symbolic lines, which translate uh, or recall a face. La Palme even went so far as to depict Duplessis as a pimp, selling out Quebec to American financiers. I despised the man. I had great admiration for his wit, his intelligence, 
but I despise his attitude towards French Canada. It was my feeling that Duplessis had uh, looked very much down on us. A man that permitted one of his ministers to say that ignorance and poverty was the heritage of the French Canada and that we should safeguard this heritage is an insult to all the community. And Duplessis minister said that, and Duplessis felt that way. But La Palme wasn't strictly alone in his graphic opposition to the democratically elected dictator. Hail, Newt Shadow. Norma Udon of Le Devoir, again, like the Marquis of Townsend, exaggerated a physical characteristic for the sake of ridicule. It's one of history's small quirks that both General Wolfe and Premier Duplessis provided caricaturists with the same zone of offense. Courageous as La Palme, Udon, and their respective newspapers were, however, for to ridicule Le Chef at the zenith of his career was to risk the wrath of God, Le Devoir drew the line at this sketch by Udon, refusing to publish it. The cartoonist had to wait until the death of Duplessis in 1959, and then publish a book before other French Canadians were allowed to see Duplessis thus maligned. Anyhow, I don't believe caricature hurts anybody. I never saw a caricature that destroyed a politician. In, and I think Duplessis died all by himself. Before La Palme, Alderic Bourgeois of La Presse was the most widely known cartoonist in Quebec. But he shied away from savagery and did indeed tip his hat to the English for a while. Cut! Then the gap between the two solitudes began to widen. <gasps> That's just... Bilingualism and biculturalism, a tongue-twisting slogan that stirs rapture in the hearts of satirists from coast to coast. We've two and one half children and a nicely mortgage pad. We're never very happy, but we're never very sad. We always use two languages and official forms and signs. For we're either French or English, but we can't make up our minds. For we're neither French nor English, ours only au français. We hate each other like the plague, and we hope it stays that way. We have ways of making you talk French. Long before Quebec's controversial language legislation, federal civil servants were desperately trying to masticate the other official language. Whichever. Shoot! 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 Ah, flute. Then came the Quebec law, the infamous Bill 22, that was to dictate whether a child entered a French or English school. Do you speak English, my boy? Yes, sir. Football, ping pong, chocolate, and the son of the bitch. You see, sir? You son of a bitch. Good. 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 <laughs> Good. Good. But the language question also preoccupies our neighbors on the West Coast, as Len Norris can testify. And uh, we, we don't believe in, in French Quebec, really. You know, down in, honestly, don't we, we? We say we're not bigots, and we, we really are quite pleased to have the French Canadians in Canada. But we'd really like to have the Plains of Abraham over again, two out of three, you know? <laughs> and so when they start changing all the names around from TCA, which everybody loved here, to Air Canada, why, and then gradually sneaking these other ones in. We just had to react to it. Air Canada, hello? Leave does when the flight Toronto to? Which is the way we're all gonna talk, I suppose, eventually. The plaintive wail goes up from St. John's to Victoria. What does Quebec really want? Sir John A. never really found out, though he did his damnedest. Please continue to wipe your feet on me. Dear sir, be impartial. Deign to wipe them on me also. We'll wipe them on both. <laughs> never fear. Sir Wilfrid Laurier knew where he stood vis-à-vis -vis Quebec, but
but he couldn't get his message across. And William Lyon Mackenzie King, Canada's longest ruling prime minister, seemed to neither know nor care. There's one man says he knows what's good for Quebec, and he undoubtedly cares about his province. <coughs> it's just a question of time. <coughs> But as he grows hoarser, the rest of the country gets deafer. Parti Québécois leader René Lévesque has repeatedly disavowed violence as a means to an end. In 1974, with the establishment of a new separatist daily, Le Jour, cartoonist Bertio was in step with Lévesque. But Canada's largest newspaper, the Toronto Star, had loftier ideas. Who in heaven really knows what is to become of us all? Mon père, je m'accuse de séparatisme. Speak English, my son. Speak English. Various federal governments have used everything from cajolery to not so covered bribery to keep Quebec in Confederation. But come to think of it, Ottawa tried that in Prince Edward Island, too. We'll take the cash! And the West has always felt that Ottawa's blandishments are aimed in the wrong direction. But for Edmonton's Ed Ulushak, the prairie farmers are too self-exalted to be bought off as easily as the Easterners. And Twistle's too proud to accept handouts from the government. He's not going to grow barley instead. And in beautiful, peaceable, insular BC, the pendulum barely moves. Oh, I, I don't think you should expect wondrous things from the Federal Provincial Conference on Western Economic Opportunities. Overnight, dear. Well, the whole thing is ridiculous, you know. And um, it, it makes no sense whatever. And, it, and, it's, um, and it's sort of exactly the way I feel about federal provincial conferences on Western economic opportunities that you might as well go and look out the window uh, as expect any great things coming from them because it is silly. Hello, fans. It's Dominion Provincial Conference Night in Canada. In the 23 years I was a premier of, of this province, I would have hated to see even one cartoon about one of my opponents, even an unfriendly cartoon. Cartoons, friendly or unfriendly, are so good, they're so valuable, that I'd hate to see them wasted on my opponents. I've never seen a cartoon about myself that I didn't like, even those that were not meant to be complimentary, and there were a few that were meant to be unfriendly. Even those I, I loved. I love cartoons. The Chinese are right. One picture is worth a thousand words, but I'd, I'd amend it and say a million words. One picture. That's what a cartoon is. Joey Smallwood, the last father of Confederation, who dragged his island province into ties with the mainland in 1949 with the stamina and tenacity of a deep-sea fisherman, credits a cartoonist for helping him. I know one in particular of my own personal knowledge, Jack Booth, uh, who used to be a cartoonist on the Globe and Mail in Toronto, uh, drew the cartoons for our uh, own Confederate newspaper, The Confederate, that we published uh, during the big battle uh, for Confederation in Newfoundland. All those cartoons were done by Jack Booth and they were, they were, they were marvelous. They were really marvelous. Carrying on the Globe's tradition, Ed Franklin saw Joey finally cash in his chips to conservative Frank Moores in 1972. Well, better luck next time, Frank. Cartoonists, by and large, feel their first responsibility should be to go to bat for the little guy. But first, they have to deal with a publisher or an editor. 
Terry Mosher of the Montreal Gazette has had his work published in periodicals ranging from an underground weekly to the New York Times. Any cartoonist who is working on a regular basis with any publication develops a certain rapport with, with either the publisher or the editor, generally the editor. Uh, in some cases it's good, in some cases it's bad. Uh, the ordinary routine is that a cartoonist will submit a few roughs or one rough or come up with an idea. I don't like to work on that principle because I feel that I'm more like a columnist. I have my own point of view. I sign my cartoons. Uh, I feel that, that with the publication, they have the right to print it or not print it. But it's my point of view. I'm signing it. I'm taking the responsibility. I didn't operate like that with the editorial cartoonists on the telegram. As far as I was concerned, the, uh, the, the cartoon uh, was a, uh, an editorial in, 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 in picture form and therefore conformed to the policy of the paper. No, a cartoonist, I believe, should work entirely on his own. I think he should be completely free of editorial control. I do not think he should illustrate the editorials. I think he should draw what he wants to draw. I don't think cartoons can be created by a committee any more than a novel can be created by a committee. I think it's a very lonely one-man profession. I don't think you can put your ideas in somebody else's head and see them come out graphically very, very, very well. I mean, hell, the editorial page was the only page the publisher had. The rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the people had the sports pages, and the columnists had their columns, and the news had the news columns. And so I wasn't about to have an editorial cartoonist, which is a focal point of an editorial page, expressing his own views. I think that the editor is a stopgap for any cartoonist. He, he can only be, go as far as the editor allows him to go. And uh, so consequently, any cartoonist, I think, in that, in that matter, thinks of an editor as an asshole. Uh, excuse me. As a political cartoonist, he's got to work very much to a discipline, a uh, daily discipline, because I'm now talking about daily newspapers. He's got to work to the discipline of a daily publication date. In the case of when I was a publisher, he had to work to the discipline of the editorial policy of the newspaper. And I don't think the artistic, uh, what the general public, you know, think of an artist and locking himself away and creating, and yeah. I don't think that applies too much to an editorial cartoonist, quite frankly. To be an editor or a publisher, the first thing you have to lose is your sense of humor. Uh, I think lots of people gave me pretty good arguments, but of course I always won. <laughs> if you're the publisher, you can't hardly lose an argument, can you? <laughs> the publisher may never lose, but cartoonists keep on trying to milk humor from society's sacred cows. Subjects that should be cricketed whenever possible, and in some cases it's t taboo, is the royal family. Uh, I, I don't understand this. Uh, sort of unwritten law that the royal family is above uh, caricature. The most reaction I've ever had to a cartoon was a, what, to a cartoon that I felt was relatively harmless. It was kind of a cute caricature of the queen with Philip on her knee as a puppet. and. Uh, there was a great deal of debate at the paper, and they finally said, OK, let's do it. And for, I guess, two weeks, the letters just poured in, poured in. And then counter letters began pouring in. But as a result of all this, I think that the, the, the thing that really, I really enjoyed was we received a letter from the press secretary of the Queen saying, dear so-and-so, what was the point in yesterday's editorial page cartoon, yours sincerely, so and so, press secretary for the Queen. P.S. This letter is not for publication. Oh, I love that. So I sent off a reply to Buckingham Palace. And my reply was Thank you for your inquiry. The point employed in yesterday's cartoon was a German Kohenor triple zero repeatograph. Pen nib. <laughs> Clever these crowds, what? If I can be of any more technical assistance, please let me know. Yours respectfully, respectfully, uh, Aislinn the Gazette. God, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Buckingham Palace. 
<laughs> a newspaper reader thinks that a person who writes a column or does a cartoon gets a lot of mail. <clears throat> well, they don't. <clears throat> but they get a lot of mail when they don't like something. <laughs> When I worked at the Montreal Star, they told me, okay, you've got free reign, but there are three things you can't touch. The royal family, Westmount, and the church. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work at the Star anymore. <laughs> but for cartoonists, it's always open season on politicians. And Ottawa remains the bull's eye because that's where the power is. We're Canadian politicians in extremely good positions and we'll tell you our ambition so that you can make a note. For we're very well respected and strategically connected and we know we'll be elected when you all get out and vote. Don't vote for me. No vote for me. No vote for me. No vote for me. I'm the proper man for your constituency. I represent the faction that should win the next election And there won't be no corruption if you'll only vote for me Throughout any election campaign, after many a handshake, a slap on the back, and an abundance of blather, the voter gradually deludes himself into thinking he's a creature with some clout. Then he drags himself to the polling booth, the undecided still swithering, makes his mark, and wakes up the following morning to find that he has shrunk to his former insignificance. Apathy, once more, <coughs> takes root in the land. But it's not only the electorate who grow indifferent. At one point in the budget debate during the Diefenbaker-Pearson years, less than 10% of the members of Parliament were present in the House, giving rise to speculation about just what goes on in that stately pleasure dome. One of the most uproarious squabbles of the Diefenbaker-Pearson era was, of course, the great flag debate that raged in the mid-sixties, an intensely emotional issue for the two major combatants and a source of merriment for cartoonists. The debate flapped on for six months with that staunch defender of British heritage, John Diefenbaker, trumpeting that the Liberals were trying to trample all over the Red Ensign. Ting of the London Free Press, a cartoonist suspected on more than one occasion of conservative leanings, sided with Diefenbaker. I was at the unveiling of the flag, and uh, we were pictured as uh, two Boy Scouts. And uh, when the flag goes up, new flag, here's Pearson. When the flag goes up, here am I. Required no interpretation, explanation. The revelation was there in the picture. Diefenbaker and Pearson were at each other's throats for 10 years from 1957 on. Diefenbaker was pushed into the background by members of his own party. Pearson stepped down gracefully. All in all, the liberal leader had been treated gently by cartoonists such as Roy Peterson of Vancouver. His record as a statesman was impeccable, that of a politician often inept. He lacked a certain devilry. Oh, for heaven's sake. There was one exception. Peter Wally, a gag cartoonist and illustrator, compiled a savage portfolio of caricatures of the Pearson years. The drawings have yet to find a publisher. Pearson passed on, and the liberals found a prince. <laughs> when Pierre Elliott Trudeau took over the ship of state, his crew and the country were ecstatic. <laughs> obviously intended to suggest that uh, Mr. Trudeau is, uh, is using the, uh, the dancing position to, uh, to do a real job on me. <laughs> um. 
Stanfield is a cartoonist's dream because he's so bloody Canadian. Clearly, a cartoonist sees some specific traits. Uh, in order to quickly identify uh, me, for example, uh, in their cartoons, so, so the public will quickly realize it's me, for example, that they're, that they're dealing with, and also to help them to give the public, to convey the public the impression of me that they want to, they want to convey. I suppose it'll vary from person to person. The cartoonist will, will, uh, will pick some feature that they'll exaggerate a bit, and people who are used to reading the newspaper or seeing the cartoons will, will immediately say that's Trudeau or that's Stanfield or something like that. So, well, I don't know that I have a favorite cartoon. I, I can think of one I see very often because, I, as a matter of fact, my wife put it up in uh, the bathroom I use it at Stornoway. It, it's a cartoon by McPherson involving uh, me and my daughter Mimi sitting at the breakfast table or the lunch table and uh, Mimi looking at me and saying, Are you really a power-hungry obstructionist, Daddy? <coughs> McPherson's message was very clear. I'm not sure what my wife's message was. <laughs> There's no mistaking Prime Minister Trudeau's message. He skis. He swims. He slides down banisters. He abandons bachelorhood at age 52. And God's truth, his wife produces two children on two Christmas days. Hey, up there, two to one. But with two little words mouthed across the floor of the House of Commons, the Trudeau image was tarnished. He claims he only muttered fuddle-duddle, but even his previously ardent admirers were left with a nasty taste in their mouth. Then came the most shattering crisis Canada has known since the Second World War, splitting the nation for many and dimming the Trudeau radiance. A Canadian finds it difficult to describe his feelings about his own country. He really does. But when they're offended, when he offend his feelings about his own country, uh, he takes it very, very hard. But I was involved personally in the FLQ situation. Uh, very much so. I was very disappointed in the whole business. I, I, uh, I took it very badly. In October 1970, Le Front de Libération de Québec murdered provincial cabinet minister Pierre Laporte and held hostage the British trade commissioner, James Cross. The FLQ adopted as its symbol this painting of a patriot, which was done almost a hundred years ago by Henri Julien, ironically enough, an employee of the Montreal Star, Quebec's largest English newspaper. Montreal's Berthiaud had one slant on the crisis, Toronto's Andy Donato had another. And in Winnipeg, Peter Cooch expressed the repugnance of Westerners to the terrorists' activity. But McPherson deplored the introduction of the War Measures Act to crush the crisis. The law in uh, arresting people without any uh, evidence at all, you know, just holus bolus, uh, was a disgusting thing, absolutely out of hand. Uh, the War Measures Act was uh, disgusting. I can't think of any other expression for it. We now have the lists of suspects. A cartoon is uh, to shock the lector, the, the readers, uh, to oblige him to think about a subject. That is a kind of cartoon. And we have a cartoon to laugh. That's another thing. But it's our job to do both, to do uh, the cartoons to, to, to laugh and the cartoon to think. And sometimes it's possible to, to mix them. Is that one of the conditions of the FLQ? It's very difficult for a cartoonist to work in a, a political or a social vacuum. Uh, if uh, suddenly there's a crisis, oh, cartoonists are out there dancing in the streets. You know? uh, it just terrific stuff. The War Measures Act. Thank God it happened. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it might sound very uh, chauvinistic, but it's true. Uh, you know, you thrive on controversy, and. Uh, 
within a limit. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't want World War III to happen tomorrow, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's a help. If World War III breaks out, all cartoonists are cheering because they've got material right there, you know. I always liked it when there were crises, you know, when there was a little war going on in Vietnam or in, in the Middle East. I loved it because, you know, it meant easy sailing for me, you know. You could hammer, you know, you just look at the editor's eyes, you know, who do you like, Sadat or uh, Goldie Meyer? If he said, I like Sadat, you know, okay, then you hammer Goldie Meyer to bits, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're always fishing at three o'clock in the lake again because easy days. Uh, it's a really a bad thing. I think that's why we all drink and smoke, because we know that we are kind of preying on the pain of the world. If everything was hunky-dory, we would be out of a job, just like a judge or a hangman. Ha! That's capitalism for you. They're too chicken to supply us with funds to destroy their system. Ha, 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 ha.